Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Empowering Musicians podcast. My name is Michael Manley, and I am your host and the founder of Empowering Musicians. And this week, uh, I've titled this episode, Finding or Remembering Your Why. And this was prompted by um, an unexpected phone call. Sometimes the phone rings and we do get called for work, and that's great. Um, Primarily, uh, I love to play and I still play quite often, um, but I don't get called for that many jobs. Um, so it was a little bit of an unexpected call and um, I didn't have a lot of time uh, to really prep for it, but I did, I did get the music learned and under my belt. Um, and I thought to myself, well, I don't really depend on this income for my main source of uh, putting bread on the table. So um, I was asking myself, well, why, why am I prepared for this? It's not something that happens very often. And um, I, I, I thought to myself, well, because I was in shape. And then I thought, well, why am I in shape? And then I thought, well, because I'm uh, practicing even without having an obligation, right? So without having a date coming up or a concert, I'm still um, I'm still practicing at home and, and honing what I do. And then I thought to myself, well, why am I doing that? And I thought, well, it's because I love it, right? So, so there is that core of, that we have to remember and reconnect with, which is like, what is it that we do? Why, why is it that we do um, what we do and and being an artist regardless of your your discipline whether it's music or visual arts or composing or writing or what have you is is really extremely uh challenging and uh demanding and you really have to love it in order to do it well and um when we love what we do it isn't work to do it now what I'm talking about is effort. I'm not talking about work as in a, a service in exchange for value. Um, of course, uh, I definitely believe that when we work as artists, we should get, com get compensated. And I was very happy that um, I was able to do this job because it was a union job. And I, uh, I think it's very important that we honor the collective standards that we all work for um, and do work that respects us as artists. So I was very happy to say yes to this call. And um, it occurred to me that when we love something, it really is effortless. Now, that does not mean it's easy. Certainly my instrument, uh, the French horn, is not an easy instrument to really um, master. Um, but it, it's not effort. It's not, we don't have to effort it, right? If we love it, then putting in the hours, uh, putting in the time to hone that over thousands of hours is really effortless, right? In terms of, it's not something that's draining. It's not something that we're approaching with a sense of, I have to do this, but it's more, um, the feeling that I want to. So it doesn't, feel like a duty, right? Now, some days, <coughs> excuse me, we will approach it and say, you know what, I just got to put my my 20 minute warm up in this morning, even though I don't feel like uh, doing much of anything right now. Um, and we, we do we do encounter those days where it, it, it we, we have to sort of talk ourselves into it. But by and large, we we're doing this on a grand scale, because it's giving us a sense of satisfaction and joy that we're not getting anywhere else. Um, so I had this opportunity um, that I was able to meet because I was prepared. And I was prepared because I had been practicing from a place of gratitude and joy, um, not even having any expectation, right? Um, if the phone rings every six months, you know, why there's no reason for me to be like killing myself an hour, two hours a day to stay in shape. Um, but I'm doing it because of that sense of, of gratitude and joy. And um, I would say kind of like meditative value that it gives me 
Um, for me, it is a form of kind of meditation. And if you listen to my very first episode and heard my story, um, you probably remember that um, there was a time when I thought I would never play again. So I really do have this amazing sense of uh, of like any sound that I, I think is a good sound that comes out of my bell. I just think it's a miracle. And it's like, I'm so grateful that I can do this, even if I'm just in my house and nobody is there to hear it, right? Um, it's really for my own sense of balance that I, I put in the time. And so there are a couple things about this. Um, one is, you know, I still got really nervous. I mean, it's always stressful when you're putting yourself out there in a professional setting. Um, this had a couple extra stressors for me. It was not a comfort zone for me. It was commercial work, meaning there, there was a click track in my ear. There was no conductor. Um, it was uh, commercial music, uh, show tunes, things like that, pop tunes that I'm not used to playing. And um, playing with some of the best musicians in all of Las Vegas who do this kind of work in their sleep. Um, so I was extremely excited and nervous at the same time. Also, it was being recorded uh, for broadcast. So all of this was weighing on me, but um, it didn't derail me for a couple reasons. Um, and it's, first of all, I had no expectations other than uh, to show up as prepared as I could be and do my best. Um, what I, what I, I caught myself doing and tried to interrupt that we all do is to try to create a complete story in my head about this job and this opportunity, right? So we love to fantasize. The ego loves to do this to us. Like, oh, um, you know, uh, what if I don't play well, what's going to happen? Um, is so-and-so going to think less of me? Did they, is, is, is that like something that they heard that mistake that I made? So there's all the stuff that we do where we, where we kind of fantasize. I hope I'm going to play the next number, right? I'm really nervous about that one upcoming passage. Um, but for me, one of the things that made it easy not to fantasize was that I wasn't really the first call for this job. And in fact, I don't even think I was the third call for the job. So whatever that story making was in my head hasn't proven true for me right so i've had moments where i thought i was awesome or whatever and it hasn't led to the phone ringing more or less often i've had moments where maybe i felt like i could have done better and i wasn't super happy with my performance and again it doesn't seem to have had any effect on this opportunity this was just a fluke thing. Nobody else was available and I got called for it. So that cause and effect of like, oh, well, if I only do this or if I do that, um, something else will happen. It wasn't really, I released myself from that whole, that whole kind of story making, that fictionalizing and that fantasizing that we do uh, when we want to project everything into the future and think about that, which is all really our ego trying to get in the way of, um, of our soul and the, and the things that really brought us to music in the first place. Um, so it was really freeing um, that I had nothing to prove in a way. Um, now, I didn't, I didn't feel like I was auditioning for anyone. Now, that doesn't mean that I didn't want to play well because we always want to play well and we always want to serve the music and we always want to um, support our colleagues and, and we want to shine, right? But it was releasing myself from that attachment to whatever outcomes would or would not um, be an effect from that. Because in reality, we never know what uh, other people are going to take away. Uh, we don't know if something's going to lead to somewhere else. Um, and we don't, we want to show up and be our best, but we don't want to feel like um, we're constantly auditioning for validity, right? That's just not a healthy way uh, to approach it. Um, and I wasn't perfect, right? I, I made some mistakes, um, but I also kind of like 
reminding myself that like what wait a minute like other people are making mistakes too like they're minor and they're probably not going to affect the overall product but like nobody's perfect up here and um none of us is perfect and that's not even the goal and we also um you know we also can get really invested in certain types of perfection like for french horn players um it often is is hitting the right note because the notes on the horn because of the way uh the harmonic series uh works and the registers that we play in are very very close together right so they're very, very small targets and we often think of uh perfection in terms of or correctness even in terms of hitting the right notes but you know if you hit the right note and you're out of tune or your sound is not great or you don't phrase something really sensitively that's equally a problem right so all of this stuff around perfectionism is just kind of like um it's kind of like a cesspool like a whirlpool that'll just suck you in and at the end of the day all you can do is be in the moment and play your best um but you can't ever be perfect um and so again i got some positive feedback which was really gratifying but again i didn't um i didn't succumb to that reflex story response right of saying oh well maybe that means this or maybe that means this or maybe they're really lying to me and they're just being nice or maybe they heard that one mistake that i thought nobody heard and they're never going to call me again or or maybe they'll they'll think that um, I'm great and I'll get a bunch of calls or whatever. Like none of that is anything other than fantasizing, right? None of it matters. It's not anything that we can control. Um, it's a waste of energy. So what really is in our control? Um, I think approaching our instrument with that sense of joy and gratitude um, so that the music that we make is effortless and not effortful. Even playing perfectly, like even playing a note perfect performance, if I'm showing up and I'm efforting everything and people sense that I have a, a really negative energy, that's not gonna be a great experience for anyone, right? So we always wanna have that sense of joy and uh, gratitude and effortlessness versus a feeling of efforting something, even if we're efforting really well. Um, and we also want to be prepared, right? And we want to serve our colleagues and the music to make the whole sound better. That's really all we can do, right? Um, and I try to remind myself that wanting to be perfect and, and being nervous um, around that is really it's all very selfish, right? And this is hard to think about because it's so counterintuitive, but it's all about you in that moment. And if you can re release that and let yourself go and just say, you know what, I'm gonna take a deep breath. I'm not gonna think about three pages ahead. I'm just gonna focus on the moment, what's happening in the music around me and then serving the music and my colleagues. Um, often, if I can get to that place, um, my performance is better. And um, I think that's true of a lot of people. So I was thinking about all of this because in the same time span, I had started a new student who um, has been playing for a little while as an eighth grader. And um, I was thinking about the parallels between how I teach and this same experience that I just had about how to show up and serve music, right? And as, as, a, as a performer. And I love dealing with beginners, returners, and recovering uh, from injury players because they, um, they really are eager to progress. And I have a method that really goes back to the square one that those, um, that community needs, right? And it involves building in this effortless and uh, sort of joyful, gracious attitude from the ground up. And that means tapping into that joy of playing the instrument. Um, 
we don't, in my teaching, we don't start with etudes, we don't start with a page of music. We don't start with a music stand. Um, what we start with is the very um, building blocks of the sound, right? And what I do is I ask students, why did you choose this instrument? Invariably, they will say, well, I, for me, you know, I heard Star Wars and I just thought, oh, that sound was so cool. Uh, somebody else might um, have an experience of a video game or they remember it from a TV show or maybe their parents were classical music buffs and they grew up listening to Strauss and Wagner and hearing great horn parts. But there's something about the instrument that draws you in, right? You don't say, um, I'm, I really love the piccolo and I love the horn too. Like, it's like, you really have to love whatever the sound is that you're, that you're working with. And so what I try to do is tap into that. What is it about this that you love? Well, it's the sound. So let's talk about what makes a really good sound and how we can do it. And we work on that. We work on producing this, tone that is just really uh, gorgeous and lovely, right? Because that is really where everything else flows. It doesn't, it doesn't really serve a student um, to take somebody with like a, a really bad setup who, who isn't making and producing the kind of tone that you want them to and take them into scales and etudes. Because in my opinion, if you don't love the sound you're, you're making, then you can't love anything else. And it's really hard. I mean, if you think about something like the Strauss Second Horn Concerto, I mean, which is probably the most difficult solo work um, in the repertoire for French horn, you can't put in the hundreds of hours that you would need to, to master that piece if you can't make a beautiful sound. So the core of this effortless, um, technique that I'm trying to build into students is that love of, first of all, the sound, and then everything else flows from there. We work on range, um, building outer, um, up and down gradually, and then we add tonguing, um, and then we talk about music, and we start working with very, very basic etudes. Um, and all of that is comes back to this core of like, I fell in love with the sound of this instrument. And that's really the essence of um, anybody, I think, anybody's music making. Um, you know, Yo-Yo Ma is not gonna get up and play um, the Bach cello suite and then say afterwards, you know, I really don't like the sound of the cello. I mean, he spends his time with that instrument because he loves the instrument. And it seems kind of obvious to say, but it's not, and I, I think I, I've had the experience where, you know, I've worked with people and, uh, you know, they might've been technically really, really good on their chosen instrument. And I would say to myself, do I wanna hear that person play a scale in whole notes? Like, do I wanna listen to their tone? And um, if the answer is no, I, I always wanna say to myself, you know, why are, they, why are they showing up? Maybe this is a sound that they like and that I just don't like because everything is subjective. Or maybe they're just not going back to that fundamental, like the reason I chose this instrument is that I love the sound of the oboe, the bass, uh, the cello, the saxophone, whatever it may be. And getting back in touch with that, um, that core. And I really think that that core of, for me, it's you know falling in love with the sound of an instrument and wanting to pursue it because of that initial um, connection. That is really true of everything that we do. And I think it's true whether or not you're making music or not making music. And um, like, if you're really excited and energized by research and surfing the internet and spending hours over manuscripts in a library, that's not going to be effortful for you. That's going to be effortless because you love what you're doing. Um, and here's the mind blowing part for me, which is that um, what that core is can, can change throughout your life, right? So for me, I've gone through periods where I didn't really have a strong connection to my instrument. 
I wasn't making my living performing and I, as a consequence, wasn't really practicing that much. I didn't take the horn out of the case that much. And what I discovered was I was super stressed out a lot. Um, I was not that happy. And um, I think it was, it was because it is a kind of form of meditation for me. And if I'm not doing it, it, it kind of throws me off balance. Um, and everything else gets a little bit out of skew. So for me, having that relationship with my instrument in some way, whether I'm gigging, whether I'm uh, playing chamber music with colleagues, whether I'm just practicing alone at home, um, and regardless of whether I'm making a living at it or not, is, um, is something that I have to do because it's so strongly connected to my well-being. Um, now, I'm not unique though, right? Like, so other people have that same connection. However, I've also encountered the opposite, right? So I have a friend who played uh, in a symphony orchestra for, I don't know, 10 or 12 years, decided um, I'm kind of done with this. this. This is not something I need to continue. And I really want to go do something else. And um, you know, he is a very gifted and um, passionate uh, therapist, right? Um, so psychotherapy and, and psychology and um, social work. And, um, and he was able to leave it and just never go back. And he was completely at peace with that. And so um, I found that mind blowing because I just would, would ask him like, you spent six years of your life in school practicing for eight hours a day. How do you just leave it, right? But people get to that point and that's fine. Um, I think the, the, the important thing is he had something else that he found that he also loved to do. And so, um, you know, we're all different and our passions can change. Um, I think the key is to try to figure out how we can find those passions and do them as our career, regardless of what they are, and keep them in our lives, even if they're not our career. So if you do what you love, it won't be easy, but it will be effortless, right? And if it is effortful, you may be on the wrong bus. So you may need to find others to make music with. You may be in a toxic work environment, um, or you may be also ready to move on to a different passion and a different path. And I would say, if you teach, be really mindful of this in your students. And are they efforting? Um, why? And is there a way to reconnect them with their initial excitement and joy to lead to that effortless um, place. And for me, I think in the discipline of music, it starts with the sound. And I think that's true of any instrument, whether it's horn or any of the other instruments in the, in the, in the box, it starts with somebody who got really excited about a sound and tapping into that and starting from there from square one with your students, especially if you have the luxury of teaching new students who are just beginning is going to be transformative in their learning. So find or remember your why. Um, remember that if you love it, it will be effortless and not effortful, even though it may not be easy. Thank you for listening and I will look forward to seeing you next time.